The transition to NACs away from CCS has gained a lot of momentum in recent months, with automakers, charging station manufacturers and charging station operators all committing to adding NACs compatibility to their existing and future products. Standards organisations are rushing to make NACs an official ratified standard, and we're going to see adapters launch in the next 12 months to give existing CCS Type 1 EV owners compatibility with Tesla superchargers. So far, when we've been discussing what charging will look like for existing and future EV owners with NAX compatible cars, we've focused on the experience at Tesla superchargers, likely with in-car plug and charge software updates for EVs that are capable of it and via a Tesla app for those whose cars aren't capable of plug and charge as well as what it will be like for existing charging network customers, software and hardware upgrades to allow plug and charge for Tesla and non-Tesla with NAX compatibility. We've also pointed out some of the potential pitfalls that lie ahead for EV charging networks and automakers making the switch, and reminded everyone that in order for the number of EVs to come to market that are actually needed to decarbonize private transit, we are going to need to see a massive growth in EV charging infrastructure worldwide, and that the transition to EVs is going to need more than just one charging network. Which is why on Wednesday this week we were pleased, if a little surprised, to hear that seven automakers have agreed to work together on a new charging network across North America that will have, quote, at least 30,000, end quote, fast charging stations for customers to use. Moreover, it will offer CCS Type 1 and NAX connectors and will therefore be vehicle agnostic, unless you drive a Nissan Leaf, it looks like. And here's what we know and what we don't know. Before I get into today's video, I have a little apology for a video from earlier this week in which I erroneously referred to the Chevrolet Bolt EV as the first EV since the EV1 from General Motors. Yeah, I was wrong. It was, of course, not because the Spark EV was produced in limited numbers before the Bolt EV ever came off the production line. I'm sorry, I should have remembered that. I should have been more clear. I should have mentioned the Spark EV and maybe thrown in that it was not a volume production vehicle in the same way that the Bolt EV was. I'm human and I screwed up. I'm sorry. Anyway, on Wednesday this week, seven automakers, BMW Group, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Mercedes-Benz and Stellantis announced that they had all come to an agreement to establish a new joint venture designed to dramatically expand the number of public charging stations in North America. What is different about this particular network, other than the fact that some of those automakers that have signed on have traditionally been reticent to work on public charging infrastructure, is that the network is pledging from its very inception to be open to all EVs from any automaker, with various press releases announcing the network will pledge support for both CCS and NAX. Missing from the press release, and sadly we've not been able to clarify information about this, is in fact the Chademo charging standard as used by the Nissan Leaf and Mitsubishi Imiev. This suggests that we will see no Chademo stations on the new network and that is particularly disappointing, especially as older EVs do generally need to recharge more frequently than fancy schmancy new ones with humongous battery packs. And if there's one thing that we are really keen on seeing in the EV world, it is more accessibility and more equity to make it easier to charge all makes and models of electric vehicle, regardless of the plug type. Frankly, I would love to see more OG Tesla Roadster charging stations and maybe more household outlets and RV sockets available as well. But that's just me. 
The press release announcing the new network is a little thin on details. We're told that the charging network hopes to eventually establish at least 30,000 fast charging stations across North America powered using cleanly generated electricity. The first US charging stations are due to open next summer and the first charging stations in Canada sometime after that. The network is promising to exceed the requirements for the US National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, or NEVI program as well, meaning if indeed those requirements are exceeded, some of the funding for the network will come from the US federal government. And for a good idea of size, it is worth mentioning that this network looks like it will be equivalent to the current Tesla supercharger network in the US, combined with the number of Electrify America charging stations currently operational in the US, and then some. In other words, this new Promise network has some big aspirations. Additionally, the unnamed network is promising a seamless experience for EV owners to use. This means, we can infer, fully integrated in-car payment experiences and some other outlets covering the news are mentioning the ability to reserve charging stations en route from within respective automakers' cars. At the same time, we're told that the new network will offer canopies where possible. And one of the major issues to date with EV charging networks in the United States has been a general lack of covered charging spaces. That can lead to overheating issues in the summer of both cars and charging stations. And it can also make the area around charging stations unpleasant in inclement weather, not to mention make charging stations subject to being snowed in during winter storms. In fact, of the road trips I've made in the last five years across the US, the majority of my slow charging experiences in the summer were caused not by the vehicle overheating, but by the black charging cables of the charging station overheating, or perhaps the power electronics inside them in triple digit temperatures. If we eliminate or even just reduce the likelihood a charging station or a cable will overheat, you are going to dramatically improve customer experience as well as improve throughput. To date, the lack of charging station canopies has been explained in some regions by local planning regulations, which are, so I'm told, tougher to satisfy if there is a covered structure over the charging station compared to just the charging station. I don't know if that's true across the whole of the US and Canada. There's also no mention if Mexico or other North American countries will be covered by this network. But I am glad this proposed network is at least pledging to have some covered spaces as well as charging stations within easy reach of amenities. That said, we would be kidding ourselves if we haven't heard this before. At one point, Tesla planned to have mostly covered charging stations, and we've had other charging networks over the years make similar promises, only for us to experience a reality in which covered charging stations are the exception, not the rule. In other words, promises are great, but let's see the stations on the ground and operational before we get too excited as to what they will offer. What is clear right now is that it looks as if charging stations will be located in urban centres and along major routes where there's already some kind of building and electrical infrastructure. This means we're unlikely going to see any green or brownfield installations. And similarly, it means that it's unlikely we're going to see the kind of charging hubs that we see in the UK, the grid serve electric forecourts that are becoming commonplace there. There, charging hubs are part of a larger EV service station that can not only meet basic needs of drivers stopping to charge, but can actually make the act of stopping to recharge on a long trip really nice. Now we've covered some basic information, let's look at some questions you might have about this announced network. Why is everything so low on details? Well, that I assume is because things are still very much in the air and every one of these large automakers is going to have to engage in a lot of meetings before they agree on anything. Because the larger the company, the larger its corporate inertia and the more time it takes to make anything happen. To be fair, 
the press release does hint that there is a lot of work to be done before the joint venture is an official entity with a name and everything else. So, yeah. Next, let's examine why the Volkswagen Group is nowhere to be seen. We know that Volkswagen and its associated brands haven't yet officially adopted NAX, but there are supposedly talks going on right now betwixt Tesla and Volkswagen over adoption of NAX. But Volkswagen, of course, already has its own charging network in the form of Electrify America and Electrify Canada, and so doesn't necessarily need to be part of this new charging network at the ground level for the benefit of its customers. That said, Electrify America isn't exactly the paragon of reliability right now, is it? So make some of your own value judgments on its absence from this particular new network. While we are on the subject, though, let's also examine why this new network will include both CCS and NACs. After all, if the EV industry is making the switch, why not just NACs? Part of it is regulations in order to get government funding. But the other answer is easy. Right now, Tesla's V4 supercharger technology, which is capable of up to about 350 kilowatts of charging, is still in its early stages of being rolled out. Moreover, there are already plenty of cars on the road and that will be in production for some time that use 800 volt CCS charging technology, including the latest electric vehicles from General Motors, every electric Porsche, certain Audi EV models, and every e GMP based electric car from the Kia Hyundai Genesis family. Keeping all of those vehicles supported by 800 volt capable CCS charging stations makes a lot of sense, especially because it will reduce dwell time at charging stations by getting those vehicles charged and on their way as quickly as possible. That means that the charging network can make more money as well. As a side, it's also probably one reason why Volkswagen Group brands aren't signed on to this new venture yet. Finally, let's talk about why it's good news for Tesla as well as everyone else. Simply put, the more charging stations that are available, the better it is for everyone especially Tesla, which to date has primarily only had to worry about charging its customers' cars in North America. Opening up to CCS cars using NAX adapters and ultimately NAX compatible cars will certainly provide an additional income stream for Tesla, but it will also put a lot of extra strain on its charging network, even if it expands it and even if other networks open up to NAX compatible cars as most have now promised to do, including Electrify America. Expanding EV charging with an additional 30,000 stalls is, frankly, exactly what the US and Canada need to be able to transition more readily to an electric fleet. However, we'd also be incredibly naive if we believed this new network was a magic wand solution to current EV charging, because that is clearly not the case, and a whole lot of intentionality is needed from this new venture to ensure that it provides equitable, accessible, affordable, and reliable charging. There's also no mention of this new company tackling the desperate need for a change in regulation surrounding overnight level two charging at multifamily dwellings like apartment complexes. While many states in the US already have rules in place to make charging easier, at least on paper, for residents of multifamily dwellings, the reality is that in many cities there are so many loopholes that are large enough to drive an electric bus through that effectively restrict access to affordable overnight charging, which in turn puts electric vehicles out of the reach of anyone who isn't a homeowner. Or, to put it differently, the majority of people born after 1985. In conclusion, I'm optimistic about this new announcement. I think it has great potential. But first, let's see some more information before we go from optimistic to flag-waving excitement, eh? 
And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note below. You can reach out to us in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you are a Patreon supporter, you can reach us there in the comments section. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links below to our Kofi Bitcoin and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing Charged Up supporters, and shout outs go out to our V2G Patreon supporters. They are Pedro Mora Pinheiro, Alan Topper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C., Hey Esker, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Ray Jean Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tazlet in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Centaur, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlal, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off grid supporters Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Neck, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S., Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Plus anybody who's joined in the last week or so whose name is not on the list yet. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on this channel. Plus on a Sunday you can reach us on Transport Evolve Take 2 for our chicken and garden update and Sunday musing. Don't forget too that we are now on Peertube. Uh, check us out there if you feel so inclined. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon and as always, keep evolving. For today's classic Mac segment, you will notice I still have my G4 behind me. It is still running OS 9.2.1 and the Z is the international version. Still running that classic Mac OS. As last time, I've put the picture in a bubble so you can see that classic bright bubblegum pink background. I I miss that. Uh, there was a, a sort of a period before Apple kind of um, really delve back into the kind of the skeuomorphic design language where everything was really bright and, and vibrant. And I, I actually miss that. I miss interacting with computers that had a little bit of a quirky nature. And, and Apple's lost that over the years. I think that it may come back eventually. Um, but right now, I think the only kind of quirkiness that we're seeing from Apple is those those weird uh, vision things. And yeah, very expensive. Would I like them? I, I think I'd like to have a go. Will I buy one? I'd rather have the money. <laughs>